Okay. And I want to welcome you <laughs> today uh, again in the Learning Planet Festival, an amazing event, an amazing collaboration of uh, what we just heard from Olivier, 500 organizations joining in to co-create this event, which is the Hopefully, it will soon be the largest celebration of um, human learning, <laughs> or maybe one of the largest ones. And uh, this effort has started about three years ago, and now is growing into a more and more massive movement. And the, today, we are going to speak about uh, movements for learning, no, not just any form of learning, but learning that is necessary because of everything that we face right now as uh, civilization, as, uh, as a species. And of course, uh, perhaps in this panel, I don't need to explain uh, the rationale for the need to of larger scale collaboration, the uh, massive uh, challenges we are facing in terms of relationship with the planet and uh, forecasts that anticipate that uh, if we don't do anything about the ongoing climate crisis and biodiversity loss crisis, the human civilization probably will not live beyond the 21st century. And of course, all kinds of fractures that we are seeing uh, within our society. Uh, and uh, the, these challenges are highlighting that we need to somehow not only exponentially grow our footprint or, earth or our technologies, but also potential for human collaboration. We really need to accelerate uh, all forms of collaboration and learning, learning new skills, new mindsets, new ways of being that will allow us uh, to move from the current paradigm, the current way of being into the, the future one, the one that will help us uh, uh, thrive on this beautiful planet and thrive together with each other. And that is what uh, movements that are joining us today are all committed to do. But the question is, how do we, how do we build up um, the next, let's say, stage of, of work with, with the, these movements? Because it's, it's very evident that even, even though there has been massive growth in terms of number of NGOs, uh, specific local and global initiatives working with uh, different uh, types of uh, causes and challenges, still is let's say not i wouldn't say that this is still uh, this, this is yet a mainstream uh we still are not reaching the tipping point in terms of the potential of our collective um uh our collectives to to shift the balance to shift the paradigm to to create the new mainstream around the uh, regenerative uh, approach around uh, thrivable futures around uh, peace-based uh, civilization. So we still are operating more at the margins than in the center. And the dominant paradigms continue to, uh, to work towards, let's say, uh, systemic destruction of the world. <laughs> and uh, uh, therefore, the, the, the topic that I would like us to explore today is uh, how, how do we shift uh, the situation? What is uh, possible? To, to create some kind of viral transition in, in the next uh, uh, 10, uh, 15 years that will spread, that will engage billions of people in, in this active transformation. How can we, it's probably more than one movement. It's more, more like a meta movement that needs to, uh, to see joining of forces of many movements working in alignment with each other. And uh, of course, the question is when we reach to the, let's say, to specific groups of people that are already prepared, it's easy to engage them. But if we're talking about cultural shifts, we also need to send messages to people that are less prepared, that maybe are operating on different, let's say, uh, time frames. They are not prepared to think strategically or they are not prepared to uh, change their way of being unless they see benefits for themselves or so a lot of discussion is happening, how can we create new economic models that will allow, allow people to act differently. And uh, so the invitation for our conversation today is let's, let's explore this possibility. What is that meta movement that can 
uh, really build up to uh, shifting of the balance. So we are going to explore a number of questions. Uh, one of them is um, the focus on the positive change. What, what kind of change we are seeking and what currently blocks us? Because each movement sort of faces southern threshold in terms of engaging uh, with more people, in terms of offerings that it brings, and uh, 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 how can we overcome these thresholds? Uh, what is possible to create to really create a movement that is uh, engaging billions and becomes virally spread around the world? Uh, and how can we actually work towards design of such movement? And uh, who, who could and should be its designers? And perhaps the design is also a movement building process. And we are going to have a really interesting panel today of people, like I said, all of them are movement builders and are creating amazing projects in different parts of our planet. Uh, we have Olivier Brichard, who is behind uh, Learning Planet Festival and also the movement that uh, fuels this festival and many other activities. Uh, we have uh, anna Louis Smitsman, um, who is doing amazing work, uh, both in Africa and around the world, uh, creating an Earthwise partnership movement for a planetary civilization, future humans movement. And you are also authoring a constitution for planetary civilization. Um, Anna-Marie Berhuve, who is actually, I think, uh, a professional movement builder of a kind. You're uh, leading a HAG Center for Global Governance, Innovation and Emergence, and you're helping many movements to take off the ground. Uh, we have Rajni Bohra joining us from India, who is one of the leaders of eco-civilization movement. Um, we have Lars Legrit from Norway, who leads the Emergent School and works alone again with many catalysts of, of movements and initiatives. And we have uh, Lev Gordon, who is a founder of uh, Living Cities Earth, uh, the movement dedicated to uh, enliven 10,000 cities of our planet. So what a panel. <laughs> Olivier, uh, let me start with you because uh, uh, when we, uh, well, I was I'm sort of considering myself to be one of, uh, let's say, minor, but, but co-founders of uh, Learning Planet movement as well. And when we started the movement uh, three years ago, the aspiration was to really catalyze learning communities all over the world uh, that are learning for creating sustainable uh, futures. If you judge like like three years into the journey, how how are you faring? What actually blocks you from uh, uh, from expanding? What are like and what are the possibilities to really create the virality of uh, what you do? Thank you, Pavel. Maybe I take two minutes to give a background of what we were initially thinking we would be doing and how it works in real life because that's I think is important. Uh, we we've been working a lot on how do you build a learning society in France with plenty of players. So that's learning organization, learning cities, learning, learning uh, uh, society. And then we thought that as we're addressing many, many complex issues around health and uh, the environment and, and many others, which are planetary, you, you have to have a fractal approach and you also have to do it at the planetary level. So we went to see UNESCO and we uh, made an agreement to create an open alliance for the future of learning with the support of a UN organization that is in charge of, of doing this. So very quickly, this was named Learning Planet and Pavel, you were at the very beginning with us to do so. And the model that we were thinking of, but that we are still thinking of really, is to create a middle ground. So we bring in this open alliance, many organizations which are at the upper ground, institutions like UNICEF, UNESCO, the UN itself, OECD, uh, Club of Rome, many others, WHO, ITU, not only in the field of education, but those big institutions. We bring in some cities, uh, not yet as many uh, in thousands, but a few cities are joining as such. We bring in many universities and leading universities like Arizona State University, for instance, but many others too. We are, so all these kind of represent the institution, all, also players like Global Education Leaders Partnership or Global Education Features interacting with leaders in countries. So that's the upper ground, but we are also bringing in 
lots of organizations. So these are among the 500 that have participated in the festival this year, which are the on the ground players, networks of teachers like Teach for All and many others, um, social entrepreneurs like Ashoka, Catalyst 230, Bridge for Billions, others. Okay, so these are networks of networks with plenty of on the ground players. More importantly, or as importantly, we're making sure that we bring many youths organization, youth-led movement in the conversation. So the Global Student Forum, for instance, Fridays for Future, Climate Science, many of these kids for SDGs and many others. And what we try, these are the on the ground and the underground, the activists. And then many of these people share the same cause and the same will, the same will to transform education, for instance, so that to better equip adults and young people to, to address the transitions. So what I see is I have conversation all the days throughout the year with leaders worldwide or with young African people or young children in the red light district area of Calcutta. And everybody shares, I mean, some common goals, but don't talk the same language, don't do things together. The big institutions don't know how to interact with the youth properly. Recently, I take two more minutes, sorry, but recently uh, Antonio Gutierrez at the uh, UNGA uh, Transforming Election Summit said that there are four ways to interact with youth. Uh, ignore them, pretend you listen to them. This is what has been done by big institutions most of the time. Start a dialogue, which is starting at the time being, so I think we're there, or really engage in co-constructing the future and having children involved in all public policies that will impact their future. And that's what we are aiming at, really. So once we've done all this and creating, bringing the communities together is the first step, then we need to create the spaces online spaces, physical spaces, so that these people can meet and do things together. So we also need to design the digital solutions, for instance, and the collective intelligence process that allow uh, the people in the field of education to share and learn from each other. I've been in the social impact and education world for 15 years, while in the open science or in the digital world, people learn from each other, make progress very quickly. In the world of education, people you know, innovate in pockets of isolation, and don't really learn from each other. So I've got so many hundreds of programs in the ground, which are great, but would be much greater if they added a few elements and replicated some elements from others. They don't do it. So what are the tools and the spaces to do so? Then ideally we would need to create a networks of physical hubs. So what are the places physically, and we discussed this a few times, Pavel, that could be hubs where you can really meet and, and grow things. In addition to this, you need events. You need events for the whole community to join, celebrate the small progress made throughout the year, share the challenges, cooperate, launch initiatives together. So that's why we created the festival, really. It's not an event per se. It's really one moment to reignite, meet, and, and start new initiatives together. And, I, and you also absolutely need concrete on-the-ground projects that can measure, that can show measurable impact. And that's a difficult place. And I think you were asking me where we are. And the festival in starting a movement is there. The communication around it, we still have to make progress, but I told you, one million people have heard about the festival this year, which is much more than last year. We're far from reaching out to all the communities we want to reach out. We are only starting to implement some real world projects, but we are. We are starting throughout the years to create learning planet circles on trans critical transitions in higher education for planetary health, on teachers for the planet, on youth empowerment, and this starts to get funded. So, Really, the first thing was starting to mobilize the, the community. The second layer was to start to have committees of practice working on shared goals. And now we're entering a phase where we start to find ways of funding some concrete actions. But it is slow. I stopped here. I was a bit long, but I wanted to give you the overview of what we are trying to do and, and quick. And maybe the last thing is in terms of values and storytelling and narrative. Maybe the one thing, Olivier, that we, we feel you're blocked like like what actually like how to what is your like demand if we, if we see this more than like an, a, a presentation of what the work we're doing but as a co-creative session to look for the next stage of of um of our collective development what do you think is the demand that uh, or the the need that you're facing so if you're okay pavel i would be happy to listen to, i will share these i give it a few more thoughts and happy to to hear about some other speakers so that I don't take the ground for so long, think about it and share this with you uh, in a second round. Beautiful. And uh, I actually wanted to invite uh, Anneluz, 
uh, because Andalus, you are also <laughs> uh, on the journey to create uh, an incredible, very inspiring, I would say more than one movement because you're working on this uh, tipping uh, point movement, the future humans movement, uh, planetary civilization. So there are like different facets of some meta movement already growing in your own space. And uh, uh, you have really beautiful plan for making it all happen. How, how do you see it unfolding? What, what, what is going on in, in your opinion? Mm, yes, I mean, and, and I like your questions about the barriers and the blockages because I was thinking this is really important and I'll reflect on some of ours as well, because I really feel that being ourselves here in a learning community, if we model the learning that we want to invite others to, then it's, it's also about, uh, could it be that there are similar kind of barriers that we are experiencing, maybe each of us in our own unique ways, but have underlying the same patterns. And that when we bring that together here, perhaps whole new solutions may, may open up. So in our case, we've been creating a, a tipping point system for being able to catalyze that movement building um, and then working with the planetary constitution, the Earth-Earth constitution for a planetary civilization as a kind of social contract and open source compass for how do we really co-create our, our worlds and futures on the basis of living systems of working with evolutionary principles, but in a way that everyone can adapt it also to their own context. So, um, you know, having it and then creating now, we're in the process of creating a DAO and um, life coded AI based <laughs> DAO, quite a handful uh, and, and looking to prototype um, how can we work with this AI technology in a way that it can really learn from the constitutional um, parameters that we've set, protocols that we've set through a learning community and therefore actually help it as feedback for making decisions together inclusively um, with the long view of for our planet uh, and our future well-being. So what I have found in my own work is that every time when you feel you know, great idea, wonderful vision, and we're getting together and then it stops or plateaus. And often a piece of the architecture is missing and still needing to be developed. Uh, for example, now that we are working with this DAO in Decentralized Autonomous Organization is what it stands for, but we like it really to seeing as a decentralized human, you know, it's, it's not just only technology. But now that this technology is here, suddenly what it allows us to do, for example, is, is in teams to work together, practical tools, tokenize it, People can be rewarded for their contributions as well. Much easier also to together um, govern and share and distribute the resources. So you're creating the new economy at the same time as creating the new governance systems, at the same time as creating feedback for an evolutionary learning ecosystem. Uh, and, and out of that process, you create the attractors also for the movement building um, that is solutionary into action yeah? and that we can then better map out together what are these transitions in terms of the energy transition, resources transition, but perhaps the most important one, the human transition, which is where this, these learning communities, I think, are so, so important. Um, and, and a lot of that, what I have found is um, sometimes a barrier, but also the, the, the challenge, the invitation, is that it is so complex. <laughs> and there are you know, so many elements um, within this, this larger transition that we're all part of uh, and that we're all committed to, there, there is so many elements that need to be coming together in a whole new way. And very often when it comes to resources, what you find is that um, movements get divided, uh, that old competition thinking comes back, the old um, you know, way of fractioning out. Yeah. Uh, so this is what I... I have found that it's so for ourselves as well to keep challenging ourselves to really, really be integral, um, to have a new way of looking around our funding, around money, our other kinds of resources, um, tokenizing gratitude and trust, and indeed, how do you measure that as well and use it as feedback. So we are right now um, at that critical point of how do we access the next round of funding for the entire ecosystem, not looking for funding for just one project, um, but for a, a whole community, but explain it in a way that uh, that potential philanthropists or funders 
understand <laughs> what is this about uh, and without them looking to immediately be able to return of investment. So it's, it's, it's working with still old paradigm institutions, mindsets, attitudes and expectations while uh, building um, the new. So I see that that is one of the, the, the greatest challenges uh, and the, the barriers or the blockages that we experience sometimes is that you do need a long breath and you do need to keep supporting each other. And that if people are coming in for instant gratification and instant uh, results, um, uh, then that can be difficult because then you get people coming in, they're learning and then they quickly go out and they go back into that old paradigm. Um, and at the same time, we also need to make sure that bottom line is on it. You know, where we are, for example, in an African region, um, we need to make sure that people can pay their bills, that they can live, that they, um, you know that they have uh, that they're not not suffering uh, right now. Uh, it's torrential rain here, half the country is flooded. Yeah. So what does all of that learning uh, mean in the context of of also those climate change uh, disasters? So yeah, these are some of my reflections. Thank you. And <laughs> complexity is indeed there, and I uh, see uh, also the note uh, from uh, Olivier in, in the chat, uh, actually emphasizing exactly the same point as uh, you just did, Anna Luis, which is about uh, the involuntary competition between uh, different players that sort of step into catalyzing positive change, but in the end find uh, themselves kind of um, getting fractured by different forces that are currently present in the world. Um, <clears throat> I would like to invite uh, Anne-Marie. Um, Anne-Marie, you also are often tasked with kind of helping create that kind of architecture for uh, movements uh, and po positive change. And uh, what is your reflection? Well, like in your experience, maybe recent experience, uh, how do you see these blockages and maybe um, what is your reflection? Is it possible to kind of get around them or is it like something that is, let's say, a systemic problem that we are facing in a way? And maybe that, that's one issue that we need to collaborate around this. Uh, how do we overcome this blockage? Type mm -hmm. of blockages? Um, well, thank you. Uh, calling in indeed from the Netherlands, from Vreeland, a little village between the waters. Uh, so really coming from a, a place of where we have learned to collaborate with water and can do that in a much better way, even as a, as a nation. But still, it has offered us uh, from very early on the opportunity to collaborate in a different way. Because if I take care of my dike, but you don't take care of your dike, I'm going to drown anyway. So we need to overcome if we want to really um, uh, work with the water. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I have been um, invited uh, since 2005 to bring into this world of trying to figure out what could really help us to move into a more heart-centered way of working together as humans, but also with all life forms. And, um, and thank you for inviting me in. And I very much enjoyed listening to both Olivier and Anna Luz, And I feel very much at home in that sense. So I will, I will not, um, I, I can give my own words to what you were both uh, describing. Um, I'll not do that. I'll add actually something that I feel um, is uh, perhaps not on uh, in, in the conversation yet. And, and for me, um, in a lot of the, the work that I do, it's always about returning to the heart and to see how I can really um, practice and be aware whether my heart is open because we're so quickly being taught to move into the mind and do stuff or, or into the body doing stuff that we um, sometimes forget oh. to use the intelligence of the heart. And in all the designs, as you are referring to me, um, contributing to the design, it's that what we're looking for. How can we, and there are of course many other uh, practices around like the U lab, the, uh, the U process, et cetera, that is also helping us to do that. I think one of the things that we bring in, in looking for and exploring heart-centered global governance, um, local governance, regional, bioregional governance, 
is that uh, we are aware of that as humans, we can be triggered to stay somehow what we call often below the line in a, in a, in a, in a sense of scarcity or danger or fear, existential fear often. And, and what we are trying to invite people in is to see whether they can either acknowledge that and stay with it for a moment so that it, the body can relax and also your other parts of the brains can light up again and you're not in your flight, fright, freeze mode, which gives you other decision-making um, uh, units than when you're in that other state. Or perhaps even see how you can go beyond the, 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 the drama triangle kind of dynamics, let's say, and being a victim or being a tyrant or being a rebel or a rescuer or a survivor and seeing how we can come in this other spaces that we have the capacities to like the creator or the coach or the challenger or the trainer or somebody that sees always a yes. Um, so that's kind of like what we feel I feel is is uh, important in the phase that we are in as conscious social architects I might call us all here. Um, if, if we can somehow do that in a way, and I think perhaps, Olivier, that's also what you're looking for in the way that you were speaking about finding a common, a middle ground, you called it, but I'm presuming it's also a common ground, that we can create these spaces where we can, if we are not feeling uh, safe, or if we are scared, or if we are feeling that something is coming up, that we can hold each other, or that we can pause or that we can just be aware of that. And when you're in it, it's not always so easy, but somebody else might be able to just hold that for you and say, hey, wait, let's just take a moment because we can then come up and make different kinds of design and decisions and also engage in another way and also be aware of life around us. Nature is giving us so much information as Anulus was also sharing, uh, how can we really come up with principles that are in nature? So, so can we can we be aware of that? Can we be inspired of what happens? Um, um, yeah, some people who know me, they know that I always play with what my dog and my cat are doing because they are sensitive to resonance. They are sensitive. So they show me when I am connected to my heart and not in or when I'm in anxiety. And that helps us. So Somehow I feel that could be one of the keys to see how we can engage in a different way so that we can stay with it, stay with the plans that we're making in order to really come to that shift or that tipping point. Thank you. Thank you. I think a very powerful message indeed. And uh, I would like to explore explore this further, maybe in the second round of conversation. But uh, because a part of what I, I would like us to explore is is the question of how how do we enable this this next stage of design? And I think you're already uh, pointing to to this uh, idea of creating heart heart centered uh, spaces and uh, ways of governance that are embracing our love potential. Um, and I wanted to turn um, uh, to another movement builder uh, who is also based, uh, I would say, in the in, uh, in a different region, in, in the global south, in, in India. Rajni, uh, I know you are you are actually leading a number of movements. So one of them is you, you, your own uh, movement uh, focused on amplifying the uh, uh, female leader's voice. Yeah. Um, and another one is uh, eco-civilization, which is actually maybe very similar to what Anna Lewis is, is creating, uh, um, a, a, a movement focusing on bringing uh, the eco, 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 ecology-focused civilization on Earth. So what kind of challenges you are facing? What, what are you observing? What are the patterns? Especially maybe in the context of India or maybe the, the broader context that we see. Okay, so... Uh... Travel, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. I'm really truly delighted to be here. 
And since I'm joining this conversation from all together different parts, uh, possibly my all friends, my colleagues, they are joining from European regions or Western regions, and I'm from Eastern regions, which has a lot of differences in culture, traditions, and of course, thought process, perspective, everything, you know, it influences everything. So, uh, of course, uh, I have been associated with two major movements. One is eco-civilization, and here today I'm representative of eco-civilization on this panel. Of course, in India, I am running another movement, which is for women empowerment, which is to amplify voices of women, that is Vaha women. And, uh, uh, you know, if you are coming to, if you are talking about the challenges, everywhere I, I can generalize my answer you know, in, in a very short way. You know, there are two things which are major hurdles, which are major road, roadblocks in my experience. One is gaps between strategic planning and the implementation. And the other is, which is very important, which is very critical, that is lack of resources, especially funding. Funding is a major issue. And uh, I mean, in my experience, majority of the movement, they transition successfully from preliminary to coalescent stage where volunteers join in, where people give helping hand because they find common purpose, common reason to join in. However, to, uh, to transition that movement to the next level, that institutionalized level, where, an, or when, where a movement takes the form of organization, you definitely need support of the uh, government. You need support of uh, various uh, uh, sectors. Uh, you need support of uh, NGOs. You need support of uh, uh, different kind of organizations, which I possibly feel is is not sufficient. And that is the major reason why majority of the organization, why majority of the movements fail, or they do they do not reach that level, desired level, or they remain unimpactful. So this is possibly my answer from my perspective as an Indian and as as far as I have experienced and learned that using my life. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I ask you also, uh, in the context of your work, do you feel like there is a deep need in Indian community for uh, this kind of issues, let's say, the shift to new model of a society that will be more sustainability focused like is eco civilization movement finding the like resonance with uh with uh, people in india, india especially india. people on the ground yeah it's, it's a very good question and uh, i i'm happy you have asked this question uh Pebal, my observation is that the world is awakening to a new level of consciousness and it is not just west it is east as well because Everybody, at the end of the day, they are facing the same reasons. Everybody wants peace, happiness, safety, security, belonging. You know, they do not want a society where uh, every second day there's a news of war or there is some kind of violence. We want to be treated equally. So these, these are the issues of everyone in this world. And, and nobody wants in this world, you know, which is conflicted, uh, which has uh, so many challenges. People want peaceful. So yes. The movement resonates very well. The idea resonates very well with Indian community as well. And I'm very happy to let you know that eco-civilization is, is, is making, uh, is coming great way in India. And many people in India are also joining eco-civilization. They are happy to join eco-civilization because they feel that they can also contribute to the cause they are associated with. Because eco-civilization is a bigger umbrella which gives vision, which gives, uh, you know, many individual projects, which helps many individuals to grow, to find their dreams. Uh, you know, they provide kind of safety net. And that's what every individual needs, uh, whosoever wants betterment of the world. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I would like to invite for, uh, Lev Gordon. Lev, uh, you are... Um... You have dedicated your life to movement building as well, <laughs> focusing on uh, cities as one of the spaces where this integral transformation of our civilization happens. As we discussed many times, uh, city is like a civilization in miniature because you have every layer of our society represented in the city. And uh, today we know that cities model the, the, the type of civilization that we probably want to see uh, fading away 
and we want to create a, a new model of a city and you call it living city. Um, so li living cities Earth started just, let's say half a year ago, but you've been building up living cities in Russia for many years before that. So your reflection on where, how does the movement unfold, where you see the blockages and what do you think should be the next stage of, of collective development, like where we are heading. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, greetings from Seattle. Uh, it's really good to be in such a wonderful company. Uh, many people actually who are on the screen right now are co-founders of uh, Living Cities Earth. And I'm not so much uh, building any movements. I'm just having fun dealing with wonderful people and enjoying life. And uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and uh, I spoke with one of the co-founders of Living Cities Earth, a gentleman from Silicon Valley a couple of days ago. He's sort of a specialist in modern movement buildings, uh, building modern movements with lots of technology, lots of um, other things. And we asked him how we build the community of 1 million leaders in our 10,000 cities on planet Earth. And he said, well, uh, there are many smart theories, but what works is uh, when people have fun together and earn money together. Um, uh, it was a little bit refreshing. Uh, for us, because we always have sort of high level conversations and talk about uh, really sort of deep and profound values. But what I took from this particular conversation is that uh, it's really important to have what uh, Anne Marie mentioned a uh, heart energy, or I call it warmth. And uh, if you know, there is this uh, a Harvard study on adult development, which says that, which showed basically, I think, over the span of 70 years, 75 or 65, that the number one factor. Uh, which brings a happy, healthy life is the warmth of your relationships. And uh, I think it's very important uh, to think about it and to uh, weave it into the design of whatever we build together in the future uh, is to have this warmth of uh, human relationships because, it, and why? Uh, my take on it is that uh, uh, we very often uh, deal with information and it's one very important. When we talk about learning, we deal a lot with new information, new uh, ideas, et cetera. But people don't live only in the information uh, sort of dimension, they also live in the energy dimension. And the quality of information we always talk about, but the quality of energy is what we need to both generate and we need to learn, right? If we talk about evolutionary learning, each one of us and all of the people who work with us, we need to learn to generate new kind of energy, which is warm, which is hard to hard which brings all people together as one sort of global family. And uh, I think for, for, for many of us, it's still something we need to work on uh, with ourselves, with uh, our teams, uh, with our movements. Uh, and when uh, people de when people learn uh, to open up their heart, as Anne-Marie mentioned, and uh, Marilyn Hamilton and Teddy and everybody, uh, of course, we deal with it on a daily basis. Instantly, the barriers dissolve. It's really, it's it's like a magical tool, uh, a key which opens all the doors, right? And um, on a more sort of uh, simple uh, level, uh, how we explore uh, this dimension of, uh, it's what um, Marion Hamilton suggested to call, uh, I think, the master code of care. When we learn to care for ourselves, and it's very important because many movement builders are tired, they don't have energy, they have depleted resources. So it's very important to take care of ourselves first, to be able to take care of people around us, our teams, for example, then together we take care of you know larger communities or places. Uh, we work with cities, for example, or, or eco villages. Why? Because then together we can take care of our planet or the whole sort of living ecosystem, and it's very important. So it all starts with us personally, collectively, and then ecosystemically. So. Uh, I have a few more points to share later on, but uh, to answer this first question, I think the first the, the first obstacle is to learn to manage uh, energy in ourselves, in our groups, and then on the larger scale on the planet Earth. And I have a few suggestions how we can do it all together, but I'll share it later. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. And um, for the first round of conversation, we have one more panelist who is Lars uh, Legrit from Norway. And Lars, you've been building up movements of uh, social change leaders and uh, leaders of different kinds, leaders also in business. 
And uh, leaders are, uh, movements of leaders are probably like herding cats. It's, it's really hard to <laughs> get them into one direction because every leader has a point. They, they all know the <laughs> idea of where, where to go. And uh, how do you think we can align? And uh, it was mentioned by Olivia that maybe that's one of the biggest, uh, the biggest problems. People tend to have this hold the same objectives, but uh, at some point the, the, they divert their paths and the conflicts emerge. Can we all align? Can we build up to the next level of collaboration? The answer is really easy, we have to. Uh, and, and, and listen to what we are talking about. Yeah, I've been building uh, movements like you have for, for all of my life. And what, what comes to, to mind here is that I think in between us, we have the most important issue in human history. How can we basically make learning uh, something global that, so that we can have a shift in consciousness? And, and in my mind, uh, how can we make that story so attractive that we can have the support of uh, a larger part of the human population on the planet? Uh, uh, I was having one reflection. How is it that the forums where human destruction is at the center like NATO and forums like that get such enormous amount of resources that are really not useful. And we know it as a majority of people on the planet. And forums like this one that is tru truly beautiful and is about the human heart and the future of the planet and the, of the people have almost no resources. If you see the resources we in between us have it, it's a fraction of of the resources going to the wrong ends, right? And then I, I had this uh, thinking like uh, the Martin Luther King of this movement, where is our communication? Where is our communication that is so beautiful, so attractive that it actually can deserve some space in, 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 in the era of, of all of this info floating around? How is it that whenever I open a newspaper, it's not the story of all the things that we want to achieve that is in the headline. I read about tanks and uh, Japan doubling their budget, and then it's another, and it's it's a lot of resources going into fear and destruction. And we are about heart and building the future of the planet, and we have almost no resources. We have almost no space in media, and we have almost no voices that be, are being heard. So how can we change that? Uh, actually, it's. Uh, uh, I read uh, what Francois today is writing now in the chat. Maybe uh, Francois, I would invite you to share your idea about uh, one thousand nights to build one thousand dreams. The story, the new storytelling. How how can we bring that to the center of uh, civilizational attention? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, we got a brilliant student that that wrote. Um, uh, the little text I, I, I shared earlier, um, and and um, you know we are in the age of ChatGPT and and you know different type of uh, uh, ways to generate uh, narratives, but you know this is a human generated narrative, and I think it's much more inspiring uh, summary uh, of um, of what we are trying to to do, and and we were wondering whether we could invite you know. Um, used to generate their own narratives uh, of the future they can be enhanced uh, by by technology if they want to uh, but they could be um, I, what i like in the thousand and one night uh, narrative uh, framework is that it's a fractal narrative as you remember you know it's stories within stories within stories uh, and so we could have dreams within dreams within dreams uh, and we could try to invite people to share uh, the dreams and the most popular, you know, can be uh, amplified further. And, and if they can help uh, mobilize uh, the hearts, because that's what I heard from, from Lev and, and I'll be happy to, to, to hear more. But, uh, you know, I think the, the, I want to congratulate Olivier and the team uh, of the festival and, and, and you uh, for organizing sessions and, and so on. Uh, the movement is growing, but it's growing among the people that are here, for instance. Uh, and, and, and so if we want to uh, include much broader audience, uh, especially the younger ones, uh, I think we have to co-design with the younger ones means to talk to the younger ones. Uh, and um, and so building uh, something like this, you know, uh, the 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 text that I sent you 
uh, we already have a podcast version, uh, and you know we can imagine all sorts of uh, of variations uh, of these things that you know uh, can spread uh, in different channels uh, to, among the youth. And but what I like about that story is that it's also an invitation to have a family conversation. Uh, and so it could be a parent reading this to the kid, or the opposite, uh, including to the grandparents and so on. And and so you can start uh, creating uh, because the places for change are the places where the, the heart is involved. And, and it's much easier. I mean, we, there is even scientific evidence now that the best way to change a conservative man is to uh, teach his daughter uh, about climate change in that case. Uh, so I think, you know, if we have uh, stories like this, uh, and then, you know, there is this poem that uh, you might have seen that I, I like very much that ends by, what did you do when you knew? Uh, and so, you know, if you invite every child on the planet to ask these sorts of questions to their parents or to the grown-ups around them, uh, I think that can lead to very interesting conversations. And so if we could, because I, I'm, as some of you know, uh, I was evolutionary biologist uh, by training and um, I did this for many years. Uh, and so I, I love your idea, uh, Pavel, of, of viral, okay? But for something to be viral, there is some conditions. It has to have its own replicating power uh, and it has to have uh, a numbers of places where it can replicate. Okay, so you have to find something that that is uh, uh, entering in resonance, uh, so that it will amplify uh, the message. Great, and actually that brings us to the second part of our conversation, which I feel is really crucial. Is uh, we all hear the blockages, we all hear the inspirational potential of, of movements that are seeking to make this transformation happen. And um, what you point to, uh, Francois, is that uh, uh, we need to change the way we design these movements. We need to engage groups that are maybe not part of the conversation at the moment. And we need to maybe change the modality in which we, we are designing this. Because uh, when I'm thinking about the work that Anna Lewis is doing, it's uh, incredible, it's amazing, but uh, I think 99.9999% of human population would not <laughs> comprehend it. It's, it's really, it's the rocket science of 21st century. Uh, how do you organize this? Distributed autonomous organizations and complex architectures for human collaboration is really very, very sophisticated subjects and uh, uh, it's needed. But at the same time, how do we uh, connect it like to this this level, which is planetary level? How do we connect it to the very localized level, like family level or personal level? And how do we engage um, potentially hundreds of millions of people in conversations about that co-design? Um, so I would like to invite um, uh, ideas, but perhaps. Uh, like I said in the beginning, the the process of design is already a movement building. It's not preparing us for movement building. But what do you think are are the best opportunities, the best strategies? And and here I'm just inviting like whoever feels like they want to speak first. Like please raise your hands. Go ahead, Lars, please. Uh, I'll reflect on on the last thing. I think. It's, it's spot on because what we need is some positive storytelling. Uh, like, uh, I think you all know uh, Churchill made this 50 year speech, how would the world be in 50 years? And I think what we need is positive stories about what could be so that we can see that that is actually a road forward because so many people have given up or don't see a way or are confused. So one of the ideas we had was say, uh, uh, like think of people like George Lucas, master storytellers. Think about it instead of telling Star Wars. Think about it if he's told stories about what could be possible to create. And actually, we have made an approach to make him make stories, have people to tell different stories about what is possible, and make it into films that uh, children could actually see what kind of future we could create. And I have a really, really simple. Uh, exercise with my students that I really love and it's 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 they close their eyes and they look 50 years ahead and imagine how the world would actually look like and a lot of them have really bad uh, visions and then I 
I close, have them to close uh, their eyes again in meditation. And then they said, uh, what planet would you like to create that is actually possible? What are the images? And then they say, two totally different pictures. And then the answer is, what would you do to bridge the gap? And and what is your dedication in life? So that shows that we see a planet, that a future for a planet that is really not very attractive. It's with wars and trumps and things like that. And we can see a beautiful planet, all of us, that is realistic. But how can we more, make more people see that and make an approach towards that? But we need some storytelling. So I love what you said, Francois. Yeah, the idea of uh, 1001 dreams of the future of humanity co-created and uh, created in a fractal way. This is really beautiful. Anna Lewis, you are also a storyteller and you have your own uh, story that I think became like an Amazon bestseller, right? That's <laughs> What's your point I about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the quest, became the quest of growth, quest of the future humans. Yeah, precisely for that reason, because I felt that all that complexity needs to come into a story people can relate to. Um, and, and the core of the story is really that our evolutionary next step is already in, within us. So the consciousness of our evolutionary next step, let's call that future, that future potential, that's already here within us. And, and if you have that trust in life, that's actually attracting us forwards. That's what's giving us the energy in the day to come up again, to face the challenges. And just for all of us as movement builders as well, and that's something I have to remind myself of too, because sometimes I get so busy in the, in the, in the work and the architecting that I forget, um, is to spend some quality time every day, even if it's just five minutes, just with your, your hands on your heart, the beautiful heart-centered consciousness that Anna Marie brought in as well, just relax into that and saying, hey, that consciousness of our next step, that beautiful future potential, it's here inside me. And can I nurture that and give that space within myself, within my conversations, within learning processes to allow that to inform us? You know, as a mother of two teenage boys, I do this with my kids as well. We do it also before we, we go to bed to just connect with that and, and knowing that no matter the challenges we face, we're going, as long as we can learn, we can grow. Um, so that, that our learning potential comes, that becomes our superpower. <laughs> um, and it also constantly supports us to be creative in how we respond um, to challenges. In that same spirit, we are working on the Future Humans game to gamify the challenges of the 21st century and that by taking on those challenges how can we at the same time grow our capacities uh, of the heart uh, our, our wisdom um, and not only focus on trying to solve the challenges to solve the sustainability crisis but how can we collaborate for the maturation of our species so we do need a very different focus thank you uh, and uh... There, I have two reflections on what you're saying, and one of them is um, starting with a positive intention, because I, I think a lot of uh, conversation that we hold in spaces like this begin with uh, the word crisis. So we are only talking about dangers of, of the future, and like Lars uh, pointed out, the image uh, that most people get when they think about the future is not very inspirational. It's it's all about wars and uh, uh, famine and and pandemics and uh, you name it. And at the same time, uh, there is like Charles Einstein says, uh, "A better world, our hearts know." And uh, and when we reach into that space, uh, the image changes. And and what you are offering is also connecting that to uh, something that is already sleeping within like a seed of that possible future and here i want to maybe uh highlight the second aspect which which came to my mind uh, when we talk about virality i think a crucial thing is having simple practices that are replicable on a personal level and maybe family level and uh, community level where we can we don't really need big structures to support them it's something that we can do on a daily basis like we all know about hygiene that we need to brush our teeth in the morning and the evening and so on. It's like very little hygienic practice about connecting to our own personal futures and collective futures is, is something that really changes our lives. Uh, 
I see hands now being raised and uh, Marilyn, please. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Pavel. And thanks everyone. I really appreciate the, the stories and um, the call for stories. And that I think that um, one of the points I'd like to make is the stories um, telling them once is never enough. They need to become like what Analos is, is telling, you know, hands on the heart, daily practice. I, I talk about taking the um, master code of care, which I have now recalibrated into Gaia's code of care because of all of the issues around the word master in English. Um, and, uh, and so that's something I tell and retell and retell and retell, and I can turn it inside out um, to start with self, others, place, and planet, or I just was speaking earlier today with Marina Demchenko when we're talking about using the opposite direction as an overview effect, you know, caring for the planet recalibrates how we can care for our places and others and ourselves. And I think that um, that's a practice I actually do use twice a day, once in the morning as an intention, setting an intention at the end of the day, how, how did I do, what, you know, did, what, what did I do? Um, and I feel that um, the wonderful stories that are parts of our cultures, they've been told and retold and retold and retold. And I think that in our modern media, we've gotten sort of um, accustomed to the constant variety of newness. And so we're not retelling the stories that really matter. And so I love the idea of the, of the story to the children that were shared earlier, because I think those those are stories we need to keep telling ourselves it's kind of like um since i live in in fintorn it's kind of like attuning attuning ourselves to um to the energies to um the dimensions that come through the stories that are not they're more than the physical dimensions in which we are so i just would like to sh share those ideas I am tempted to bring in uh, to conversation uh, also Howard Blumenthal, but maybe after uh, Anna Marie speaks. Uh, Howard, you are also <laughs> a master storyteller and you are working with uh, children and their stories. So maybe you could uh, later share your perspective. But let me first give floor to Anna Marie, please. Can also go now. I'm not, uh, it's okay. But uh, all right. I would maybe would like. It's now, and then I'll pick up after yeah. that. Cause... Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, kind of surprise. Uh, so, <laughs> so I come from a long time of being a television producer, primarily for some well-known children's series in the U.S. and elsewhere. One of them, world, where in the world is Carmen San Diego, that was based upon popular software. But I've been focused for the last five years or so on what children and teenagers need to know, learn, understand in order to be able to succeed and flourish in the 21st century. And I'm now with the University of Virginia as the executive director of the 21st century um, learning project in which we are constructing a practical but quite different way of spending days at school because I frankly think that most of what's being done in school every day makes little sense because we're dealing with early 20th century subjects and curriculum. So much more emphasis on personalized learning uh, or personalized education, because I think everybody is a personalized learner, but I think the education system disallows that. Um, and, um, and freeing teachers from curriculum. I just think that at this point, we really need to be having a structure that'll, that encourages individualized uh, learning based upon fundamentals that everybody shares. So we've begun this process. Um, there's a fair amount of background and information, but all of it comes from working with children and teenagers, bottoms up. What do you want to know? How do you want to know? We will be surveying, that's my next meeting, about 25,000 um, students throughout the world in about 200 countries. I'm sorry, about 200, in about 20 countries, uh, and um, about 10,000 teachers simply saying, what do you want to learn within my body, my mind, my planet? So we're organizing this in ways that are very practical and hopefully acceptable as a means to move ahead. But we're, we're at a point now where we know what we want to do and we want to build alliances with others. So the reason I'm here um, is to begin to think about how we can participate much more boldly in um, 
in this community that clearly is in motion and we're just beginning to figure out how to get into motion. But um, that's the, uh, and then the overlay on that, I did make a note, Anne-Marie, you had, you made me think about this. I'm also a senior scholar at the University of Pennsylvania in the uh, Positive Psychology Center, working mm -hmm. with Mark Seligman and the like. So the combination of resilience, future-mindedness and all of that, and the practicality at the University of Virginia in the School of Education about how do we actually do this um, has been a very satisfying combination. So I'm happy to answer more questions and, um, and I'm I'll put my contact information on the side, but thank you for, uh, for thinking of me and allowing me to speak. And questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, Anna-Marie and uh, I think yeah. Olivia also has something to share. Sure. What I what I was wanting to share, and I, at that fits, I think, very nicely to what you're sharing, Howard, was how I have some this when I I asked at a certain point I was walking on the beach with my youngest daughter and I was asking her, she was 16 or seven, something like that, 15, and I was asking her to share a story. And she said, Oh, what what was going on in her and, and how that would work? And she said, well, it's a bit complicated to share. You won't really get that. So I said, well, try me out. And what she was sharing then at a certain point when I kind of like continued to ask her was that in her, in her way of storytelling for herself, she was having a movie full color with music. She was having multiple layers at the same time going on. She was having storylines that were connected to all kinds of different subjects um, because I'd been sharing with her about the wheel of co-creation. So she could really point out, and that's how she tried to explain to me what her storylines were about. And I'm just giving this example that I feel that if we really are able to open up to young people, then that's part of the intergenerational, art of intergenerational interaction that we're working with, to see how they do that and really share. It really took me some time to convince her to try and tell. And she said, well, this was three storylines. I have five more, but this might be enough for you. She did that very, very lovingly. And she's right. I, can't, I don't have that kind of multi-layeredness at the same time, in the same moment going on. So I'm noticing a lot of youngsters and kids this morning, also I had a, a conversation with a young man that are so differently, like let's say wired, and at the same time, there's of course a connection, but the digitalization, the different ways of working, it just comes up with different ways of sharing with also so much images and not only words. And so the, but, but to, to come to that, their first, well, my experience now is that there first needs to be a strong connection, some kind of a heart connection, a, 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 an invitation to play, to really do it playfully and to practice. And out of that, then start to develop a mastery harvesting a little bit but very lightly because otherwise it becomes too much kind of like fixing it an appreciation which then reinforces the connection and then a next level of play can happen so how can we design um, these storylines in a way that also brings space to these kind of ways of collaborating that's part of what we're really practicing within the Hague Center and seeing how these youngsters, but also those with ADHD and with ADD and with autism, they have different ways of looking at the world where we can learn from and come up with another way of coming together. This is very inspirational. <laughs> uh, if somebody feels that they could kind of take on this uh, topic and, and, and maybe further explore it i would uh, invite your reflections because i feel that th this is really a, a powerful tone that we have here in the space at the moment with yeah, particularly think... th this kind of practices that we, we can think about olivia i know you were no, you also had I... an idea about yes but i think collaboration you... with... yeah i, I would like to to jump in and i'll come after but after this. 
So, Pavel, uh, I just wanted to add on to what my friend said, and I really loved everybody's reflection and perspective. But I just wanted to add one more thing. Tell the stories in the language they understand. That is very important because mine is a country which has hundreds of languages. And mm. every time, most of the ideas, most of the ideas are communicated in English. Uh, yeah. And I, I really understand that we don't have any common language other than English in India, which connects people. But unfortunately, English is only understood by 5 to 10% of the people in India. So rest of the 90% of the people, they are not able to comprehend what is being spoken or what is being discussed, no matter how valuable that idea is. So important is tell the story, the language people understand, irrespective of the age. People should be able to comprehend and let them judge on their own what they want further. But first of all, they should be able to comprehend the idea. So this is what I wanted to add on to what my yes. friend said. Thank you so much for this. Yes, great. Mm. Great point. And I, and I feel like uh, actually the really important point that I see resonating here, something that Anne-Marie said uh, that you are saying, uh, and I guess what Olivia wanted to say on a different level is, is about connecting spaces, actually connecting languages, kind of, uh, bridging those uh, those different, let's say, realities where people are using their own way of perceiving the world, but how can you bridge them and, le and, and learn from them in an informed way? Um, Lev, do you want to comment on that? And maybe then we can switch to Olivier and his uh, idea, which I'm really eager to hear. No, actually, I'll come after Olivier. All right, Olivier. Okay, no, so some, we've had this conversation a lot. So I come from, as a young man, I was spending my life in books, and until my 30s, I was a publisher of something like this. All the storytelling is absolutely key. But one of the story I haven't managed, we've discussed it, started discussing it in January 2020, with Pavel and still haven't moved forward that much. And I thought today we could maybe start also thinking about it, is the story about how do we co-create some shared governance uh, between such organizations. So I put in the chat, we're working with so many networks of, of cities, so I'd be happy to hear about LEV, but they don't work on the same, you know, some of the shared goals. That's one thing. But to come to the, to the uh, so that's really to me, shared governance, we started discussing with Creative Commons, uh, in 2020, and then there was uh, COVID, and this conversation stopped. And I think this would be very powerful, very simple thing. What can we do together? So happy to have this conversation. Maybe another one. We can reconvene if we don't have time today. Just to come on the stories and the languages quickly, and then I give you a. In a way, we are starting to create some localized. Um, we, we had an African youth and Ubuntu youth circle created because we had the youth empowerment circle with youth from all over the world. A lot of Indian would participate. They would have translators when they were speaking in, in different languages than English. So we try to organize this, it's difficult. But in a way, when we have a global movement, but also local chapters. So the youth, African youth movement is growing very strongly within the Learning Planet Alliance, because in a way we are giving them the keys to do it in a completely different way with different languages, but we still connect on a regular basis. So maybe that's also a way of having some shared global stories and there's, I mean, AI and everything that's going to help for some translation and understanding. We did a, a writing competition with the Little Prince of Saint-Exupéry. We started in six languages, but we could do it with more. I stop on the stories, but really, and maybe Lev, that's what you, you, you will be building on. And Pavel, you've been challenging me a few times about when do we get started with this open governance between our networks. So that's where I shift a little bit. Thank you very much, Olivier. Indeed, that's uh, where I'll pick up from you. And uh, if I have a couple of minutes, I guess, um, I'll show a couple of slides just to support uh, my voice with some images. Uh, but before uh, talking about the viral practices, uh, um, some of you know there is this uh, nonprofit organization called uh, Art of Living. Uh, it came from India, actually. And uh, what uh, what's their uh, viral practice is the breath, right, special types of breathing uh, from yogic tradition, etc. And uh, from what I know, there were about uh, 400 million people on planet Earth, which is quite a few, uh, who have learned this practice. Of course, not all of them do it on a daily basis, but it's just another example that we do work with our body and our energy. And this really connects people. And I know they have, for example, uh, organizations in 155 countries and I don't know how many cities. 
So, uh, and uh, the founder of this organization, Shishi Ravi Shankar, he was part of uh, Living Cities events, and uh, we could connect to him and other people who already have larger sort of networks uh, which deal with human consciousness, human, you know, experience and uh, human cooperation. But let me quickly switch to a couple of slides just to support our discussion. Oops, uh, let's let's see where it is. Share a screen. I, I, let's see, I guess that's it. Uh, do you see the blue uh, background? Okay. So uh, together with about half of this group, we are uh, co-founders of this Living Cities Earth movement. It's a very young one, but all the co-founders, they have different organizations and also movements which date to last century or last millennia, actually. And um, uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, I think it's very important in whatever we do not to be too serious because life is short, energy is limited. We can do everything, even if we are together, but we can do a lot if we enjoy doing this for extended period of time, for years and years to come. So uh, many things we can do together, as Olivier mentioned in this uh, uh, Howard mentioned and uh, uh, and and each one of, of us, we can explore, interconnect, integrate, engage, consult, research, educate, organize, and many many other things. Laugh and celebrate together. Um, those are some few points I, I I prepared while I was sleeping today. Uh, it's still early morning here on the uh, Pacific uh, Coast. So uh, number one, uh, I think it's very important when we talk about learning not to think about new knowledge only, but really think about new action, new lifestyle. So our learning, uh, all of us, I think it's very important to move to this sort of final level of impact uh, staircase. How do we really change lives? Not only how we learn new things, but how we implement them on a daily basis. Uh, the second one, I think what we really are trying to do in many different ways is to have a consciousness of unity, where we feel connected to each other and you know larger uh, living system, and also united action, and that's what Olivier mentioned and a few of us mentioned as well. How do we do it? The shared governance, etc. Um, we all know that those problems uh, need to be solved at a different level of consciousness, both for ourselves, so we need to learn constantly, and also support learning and the change of consciousness and action uh, with people with whom we connect through those movements and communities, etc. As I mentioned, we, we need to move from working only with information to working with energy on our personal level, but also on the collective level and learn how to manage energy and teach others how to do it, because this will really open up. And uh, when I talk about energy, it's not only our personal energy, but uh, as you know, from all the traditions, from yoga, qigong, etc., there is this life energy, right? The qi, ki, uh, prana, etc., which is freely available to every person. And if we learn to access it and sort of uh, use it in our activities, it will become much more effective. So I think it's very important for this global meta movement to work with it. As I, as I said, and as Anne-Marie mentioned, uh, the heart-based approach is very important because Earth is what connects all of us on the outside. But inside all of us, we have this heart, heart consciousness, the warmth, right? love, uh, caring. And uh, if we base and it's also a very simple concept so it's not something like rocket science but every person in india in you know ukraine in united states in africa we all want to be connected to other people except maybe some introverts like me but otherwise most people like to be connected and share this warmth of relationships um, what we also talk about very often is that we need to think about temporal dimensions so not only take care taking care about ourselves others planet and etc today but also thinking about the future, the famous seven next seven generations. And most people, uh, to some extent, they also could engage into this idea that what I do today to support at least my family for the next seven generations, some people think on a larger scale, of course. Uh, I won't uh, talk about integral approach, I agree with simple practices. Um, to build a common movement or meta movement, we need a common identity. And I think the most, uh, simple and accessible common identity that we're earth citizens right so creating potentially a passport and for people many people or, or planet people... planetizens as as uh francois and uh, mm -hmm. colleagues here have suggested a really beautiful word exactly exactly so uh, for most people out of those eight billion on the planet most people are not rich they don't have much resources for, for so for them to access and have this 
identification that they are part of this planetary family, I think it will be another form of capital. So it's not the financial capital, but it's a reputational, social capital, etc. It gives energy that right? you are part of this global family, whether you live, you know, in a poor village in, uh, uh, you know, in Thailand or in somewhere else. Um, common currency, I think we need to use modern technologies and what uh, Annelies, uh, Annelies uh, said, uh, sort of different types of DAO organizations, blockchains, etc. Um, and I think it's pretty possible to give, uh, you know, ownership of our common future in a very material uh, form to every person on Earth. And so there are ways to do it. Um, number nine, uh, uh, and I think uh, Olivier also mentioned. Left, it, left, how, just to clarify, how many more points do you have? Because I, I think it's important that oh. we really share the space. Almost done. Almost done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, what we, we could uh, do all together, of course, uh, is to build this network of learning and learning and action uh, centers like Earth uh, embassies in every habitat. So all the cities, 10,000 and smaller villages, we should really be like the heart of this city or village or community and share the knowledge, information, connect with each other and build this sort of global network of action. Um, I mentioned a few sort of billionaires uh, like uh, Vitalik Buterin, Bill Gates, Michael Bloomberg, etc. Uh, if we build this global united sort of vision uh, with a clear plans for implementation, including the planetary university, etc., I'm pretty sure that we can get uh, attention and, uh, and large funding from one of those people or institutions and basically create an Earth Bank which would support all of our uh, projects on a more sustained basis. Uh, we have this goal and I want to share it and invite everyone to interconnect, right? In a sort of horizontal way. So build the action network, not the logos on the website, which is also good, but the action network of thousand institutional partners where we all help each other and act on some joint initiatives. Uh, and eventually each of those institutional partners deal with, you know, uh, what we call positive change leaders or activators on a local level or in different uh, global institutions. So if we build this network, we can, you know, uh, use it to uh, create a sustained a positive change. And uh, the question was uh, who will design and do all the things. I think we will do it, of course, with other people. And uh, one of the specific steps, uh, again, half of us, we are part of this Living Cities Earth Movement, which is just one of many, but uh, we have a meeting on February 1st and March 1st it's a co-founder circle. So we invite uh, those of us who are interested to join the co-founder circle and we can deal with all those discussions there on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Pavel, pass it on to you or oh, Anneluz, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Anneluz, please, over to you. Thank you. Wow, beautiful. So just another element I'd like to, to contribute to this is to also include indigenous wisdom, indigenous communities, indigenous principles. Uh, sometimes in the Western world, we can get so excited about the systems we create <laughs> that we forget to, to learn and listen to you know, so many of these beautiful indigenous communities that have been um, creating movements uh, and stewardship and communities. Uh, you know, we are all of us, of course, are also indigenous, uh, but it's good to, to, to bring up, up that wisdom. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. And there are many very simple um, principles that they work with. Like the first one is that uh, life is family. And yeah? the tree is part of your family. The autumn is part of your family. Uh, we're all, all related. So you tell that to this, share that with your children. If the children know local life is family. And the second is um, that the land grows you. <laughs> so and the, the earth grows us up. Um, and, and, and supports us to bring forth our humanity, so a living relationship um, with the earth. The other one is that uh, both our ancestors of the past and the ancestors of the futures are standing in circle around us and we are part of this circle of life. In this circle, everyone is uh, of equal value. Yeah? Um, all, all of us matter. Um, living in right relationship. And so, and also what indigenous wisdom is very often is based on is, is creating common, and new rituals um, so that if the storytelling if you're connecting the storytelling that we were talking about, about what, what are the new ritual, rituals what are the, the beautiful new ceremonies um, that help us to truly 
sense of experience that we, we already are, uh, all of us here together, the future emphasis of this emerging new civilization that we are all here together co-creating and that we may have different names and wordings of. Um, so that element of ritual ceremony, uh, indigenous, indigenous principles. Beautiful. And uh, I feel very inspired by the conversation that is happening right now. And I feel that uh, this conversation deserves to be continued, not just continued in form of a conversation, but more in form of actions that we can take together. So uh, maybe we could spend the last uh, five minutes of our um, exchange of our opinions um, to share some opportunities. And I already heard an invitation from Lev to uh, come into the space of uh, Living Cities Earth to join uh, their conversation. Uh, Olivia, I guess uh, um, Learning Planet will continue. Uh, work you mentioned and uh, Francois mentioned uh, the work on uh, children rights declaration, which may could be one of the connection points. What, what do you think could be the, the ways to hold, hold our vessel, so to say, to, to explore this further? So if I may share one very pragmatic approach is that from the festival in the past years, each time, each year, we visited some commitment, but we co-create with one, two, three or four partners, a learning planet circle on a given subject. So we've created the Youth Empowerment Circle together with Catalyst 230, Children in All Policies, Ashoka. And so we are not alone running it. We are co-designing, running, and it's growing with plenty of other partners and kids for SDGs and the DICE. And this is growing and it's having more and more impact. We're doing so with universities, with Arizona State University, Dartington Hall, you know, uh, Alan Bolden. And this is growing also. We do this with teachers. And I'm thinking that around governance, you know, between big networks, which are aligned in some ways, maybe the conversation of a circle could be co-designed, co-animated with you, Pavel, with anyone who wants. And, and we could work more specifically on, on, on the subject of creating this alliance. In parallel to this, we will indeed be developing some, uh, some programs around youth storytelling and things like this. I'm very happy for any progress that is made by any of us to share and get the others involved in this. But maybe if we are intentional about creating more links, this is probably the one that I'm missing. I have all the levels of collaboration with the teachers, with the youth, with the universities, with the young African, with Ubuntu, with imagination and, and uh, uh, indigenous people in Australia. We created this imagination circle and we are going to raise 10 million in the coming years to support imagination. But the one about governance, which we had started in 2020, we're not really doing it. So I stop here. I see that uh, Lars has raised his hand. Just before Lars speaks, I want to say that I'm happy to support this and I feel that it will be really important to continue this conversation. Lars, please, over to you. Uh, I love what we said about governance that we need to coordinate better, but I also see that we really need to channel a substantial difference in the funds we have. Uh, think about if you had really, really huge amount of funds, the amount of uh, uh, projects we could uh, really realize. We have a lot of ideas in between us, but we basically lack funds. So one of the things we, we have been talking with Paula about, how can we go into, like, I come from Norway. We have a fund here with $3,000 trillion in it that is the largest fund on the planet, and it sticks, it's not doing a difference. It's not it's it's not sane. So we need to 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 find ways to channel and tell stories. So we channel much more funds into all the amazing projects we have because we can actually change the planet. And yeah. how do we do that? That's really interesting. Very quickly, or maybe Francois, I know how what wants to speak, but we've started discussing with big organization about creating dedicated dotation funds for youth and for different other subjects so this is very complex complex with uh, internationally but if we are to do this with a range of organization maybe the governance step about how this would work you know is also at least a conversation which is important because it gets quickly complicated if we are many yeah, yeah. yeah. all right uh, yeah it's also really important that we center on one, two, or three big ideas 
and get a lot of people to sign up for those ideas. We have way too many ideas and it's very difficult for anybody, even the ones who care to go, so what did we say? And that's why I love the idea of the declaration if the declaration was six sentences long and it was signed by a billion kids, right? And we have to think about how do we do this simply so we all understand that we're trying to stop the Vietnam War or whatever the one sentence, this is what we're trying to do. And we all are so interested and so passionate, it's difficult to focus. But what we need now desperately is a simple way of saying we want this. And I'd love to work with you guys on that. Uh, there is a quote that uh, Lars often remembers, but I feel it's really an, an important one from Victor Hugo. There is nothing more powerful than the idea whose time has come. So it's actually about de defining what is the right idea. Um, all right, we are approaching the very end of the session. And uh, as one of the proposals that also emerged is uh, that Francois Tadei suggested, what if we actually look into possibility of two circles? So one dedicated to governance and another one on topic of the session, which is making learning for transformation viral, amplifying the global movement of evolution learning. And perhaps both are really very relevant. So uh, yeah, if you feel like it, if you feel like you would like to join, let's, let's, let's keep ourselves in the loop and let's continue exploring these two topics together. What we do usually when we talk about the circle is a kind of a monthly meeting, a bit prepared in advance. Three, four people are kind of preparing the session really about some of the subject. And we and so it's quite light. It's very it's getting more and more efficient. We have some kind of model we can share and it can be adapted to any type of so these two circles could be two new circles we create. I agree, uh, Howard, we're having so many incredible ideas. But if we were able to have one which is really strong, raises raises attention, and and I did advocate a lot at one point with Francois for everything we were doing with the dice and with so many is about this declaration and and two twenty four because it's Paris Olympics and it's a way to drive attention that we we could play with. So that could be an urgent, you know, subject to mobilize and one hundred year after the first declaration of children's rights have something very impactful. But I also think that on the long term, and, and meeting Lars on the idea of there are so many funds around, but there are not the big players in a position that can be credible, understood okay. by these big funders. Hmm. And so we need the, this yeah. kind of very strong governance model for impact. And let's stop speaking to ourselves. We need to speak to the media. We need to get the word out, but we need clear messaging to do that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, one, one candidate for such a message that I feel could also be there is something that we explored yesterday, which is the possibility of peace-based civilization. And uh, when we spoke, uh, when we had the conversation about the, the, the topic of peaceful futures, and we know that actually the condition for human uh, society to flourish is actually that we have peace on earth, otherwise, uh, it quickly gets fractured and we are entering the risk of uh, elimination of our species and perhaps the whole biosphere. There is a clear pathway that we can take uh, that in, let's say, 30 to 60 years from now, we create conditions for uh, peace-based futures. And uh, if we really uh, shift to, 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 to that uh, possibility and we see uh, that it's it's not theoretical, that it's uh, really possible, and it depends on actually engaging a, lo a lot of people. It starts with the storytelling. It starts by the, with telling ourselves story that yes, it's possible. It starts with engaging youth and empowering youth because young people don't want wars anymore. They want peace. And if they are able to, to be part of governance system, they really uh that that's 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 something where where the, the change can happen so let's let's work on those powerful messages i think that's that's one of the things we really need uh to focus on and and i know we have to wrap up so maybe if you have like maybe one final comment from each of you like basically one <laughs> word or one sentence that you feel summarizes this part of our conversation at the end of uh of our meeting 
I welcome your final reflections. Let's take three more minutes to do it as we're completing our circle. Where are we? What's your what's your taking away? <laughs> I, I, I could say I love that we brought the children in here. And the wisdom of the children, it, 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 it connects to the heart. How can we create that story from the heart that unites humankind into really change the game? And we touch on, 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 on that, and that uh, fills me with joy and hope. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Lars. And Marie, you wanted to say? I'll, I'll, I'll come back later. Mm. I'm, I'm just letting Lars uh, said very resonant. Lars, thank you. <laughs> so I'll I'll just wait and see if there's anything. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> we just can stop here. <laughs> Actually, there is no obligation. But if you well, feel I, like it, yeah, I can say I I feel the question that you're bringing is actually how do we live our lives? How and. Marilyn often says, how do we human better <laughs> um, from the heart as well? So, so it's, it's for me, this kind of work and these conversations are not a one, stand, don't stand alone. It's always a continuing journey because that's what we're doing, actually. And, and yes, we need to, it's nice to, it's a good idea to reach out to more and to really involve key players that are doing that. And I think the reaching out gives a little bit of a push and I would rather attract them in. So finding those and then creating the stories in a playful, heart-centered way will bring them in. Mm. And here, Thank you. May I add one, one thing, what Annie said? Yeah. So Annie said a very beautiful thing that living with heart, living with your life by heart. And let me add that we live, we need to live consciously conscious, you know, whatever we do, we have to stop walking in the sleep. We have to be very, very conscious because ultimately at the end of the day, everything comes from origin from our conscious. And even it goes into our heart. And sometimes we feel that what our heart is saying is right, but actually that is not always the right thing. So staying conscious is very important. I just wanted to add that. Thank you, thank you. And, and I would add, mm -hmm. Please, I, I would build on Anna Marie and say that I think the governance has to be heart centered, which is something that she has been um, pulsing for many years now. But also, the stories are self organizing, and I of the mesh work say we need both the heart centered system and also the self organizing stories to repeat if we want to go viral. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, again, so keen about the stories, but one of the things we are trying, I mean, really the narratives and the stories and the stories from youth are the heart of everything you do. But we're also trying to tell the stories of what is happening, which is absolutely fantastic on the ground, sharing it and making it grow. Because and every time we engage with young people and we engage in big conversation with Ubuntu Learning Circle, very deep, very heartfelt, with very strong level of connection during the, even at Zoom, which is difficult because we share very intimate things. But when youth are here, they want action and not, not only the stories, really urgently. And I, I would never want to forget this, this urgence of action for the young people also. So the heart has to be there. It's a great starting point, heart and head, but the hand and the action of what we do is what they crave for. And each time I have an yeah. Ubuntu learning circle without youth, it is mindful and warm and deep. Each time the youth are there, they are frustrated with this. They want more. Oh, thank you. And the Lewis, please. Then maybe as a final reflection, it'll be great if you can harvest them on each other or if you can do that uh Pascal or olivier um the the tools that we have that we are using that we see are working to really empower you to one take action but also be part of the governance and the co-creation of that and if we can even have all of those tools that we are working with on one page so we can see that with each other 
um, mm -hmm. because that that may actually really uh, empower us also in a really practical way. <laughs> Uh, uh so keep, that's when i feel really really harvesting what what works what have we learned what are, what you know what can we share not just about insights but also really the the, the, the tools the technologies the ways the resources even for some of them how to write for youth to write the proposal uh you know how to mm -hmm. to be an entrepreneur in their communities so uh, whatever we can share with each other um and make it more available for them would be great <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Lev, would you like to comment or? Uh, on a practical level, I would love to have a copy of our chat because there is so much wisdom. You didn't have <laughs> enough time to read all of it. And I think it's important to share the content. The recording will be placed but... online after, after the conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Including the text chat. Okay. And uh, yes. to share the contact so we can keep in touch and collaborate and create this larger circle. Thank you very much. I yes. had fun today. Thank you. Meaningful fun is the driver of viral movements. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a real joy. We need more young voices, but there was a lot of wisdom today. And looking forward to continuing this conversation. Have yeah. fun. And Thank you, have a great was a very the day. Thank you so much, Pavel, for bringing us together. Olivier. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And thank you, uh, Francois. Okay. Good luck, you. Olivier. Good luck with, uh, with the, the rest of the... Yes, amazing. Great initiative. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Pavel, Goodbye. so that you know, in, a, in a parallel session, there was an interesting conversation with Arizona State University about uh, topics that are very complementary uh, to build uh, a new master program that is uh, partly digital so that it can scale but uh, uh, so for all the the knowledge that can be imparted digitally but uh, the action should be local uh, building on local NGOs needs and and uh, and capacity to mentor uh, the students and inviting the students to document what they do uh, in a triple way uh, one is you know the social dimension of it one is the scientific dimension of it and one is the emotional and artistic dimension of it so that uh, you generate content that can scale and and become viral you know it could be the artistic representation of it it could be the 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 technical uh, parts or the or the social part but all of them should be documented uh, so that they can become viral amazing there's a lot of work to do Thank you very much, everyone. Let's let's connect after the session and make sure we don't lose any of the viable ideas and they leave onwards. So thank you and have a great end of the day. Bye-bye.